By patron request, NES Works Guide In gets medieval and mysterious. Kiss. Nintendo localized the bulk of its first party Famicom creations back in the day, to the point that the few games that didn't make their way to the US or Europe have become noteworthy by simple virtue of their absence. A lot of those games didn't make it overseas for cultural reasons. Think Devil World or Mahjong. But a lot of them simply didn't make it over because the games couldn't fit onto an American NES cartridge once the text inside was localized from Japanese to English. But there are a handful that seem like they should have been shoe-ins for overseas release back in the day. And foremost among these is Famicom Disk System's Nazo no Murasameijo. An early Disk System release that could basically be described as The Legend of Zelda with more action set in medieval Japan. Who doesn't want to play a game like that? When the Famicom Disk System debuted in February of 1986, it shipped alongside a bunch of budget edition reissues of older first party games. Its standout title, of course, was The Legend of Zelda, a top down action RPG patterned after the likes of The Tower of Jiraga, which had been a massive hit for Namco on Famicom the year before. The add-on wouldn't see any third-party software support arrive until July of that year, which meant the months between launch and the arrival of ASCII's box puzzler Namida no Sokoban Special, aka the Tears of Sokoban, a fitting name if ever there was one, were filled with a handful of Nintendo-developed releases. In fairness, Zelda's enormous size and complexity meant that it was the kind of game that could easily take kids several months to complete, especially before the arrival of strategy guides for the game. Still, for those who craved something new or just wanted games that challenged their dexterity rather than their brains, Nintendo shipped two standout disc system releases that spring, Super Mario Bros. 2 and Nazo no Murasame Jo. Enough ink has been spilled on Mario 2 over the years that I don't need to relitigate it here, especially with a retrospective on the American Super Mario Bros. 2 due for the somewhat near future on the NES works. On the other hand, Nazo no Murasame Jo, or The Mystery of Murasame Castle, doesn't have nearly so much visibility, especially in the US and Europe. Murasame Jo didn't launch a series or even see spiritual successors from Nintendo, and the game, for whatever reason, never made its way outside of Japan until it hit Virtual Console as an import, and not a Wii Virtual Console import back in 2007 or 8, back when people actually paid attention to such things, but 3DS Virtual Console in 2014. Its absence in the West during the NES era has always seemed curious. By all accounts, it should have been a perfect candidate for release. Despite its theme of martial combat in feudal Japan, Murasame Jo's Japanese nature was the sort of thing that had long been popular in Western media. A brave samurai battles his way through an army of ninja to take on a succession of five castles and defeat the diabolical warlords within. The game has no Japanese text, and its disc system specific feature, the ability to save your progress and record your high scores, could just as easily have been replicated with a simple password system. More to the point, it's a fast-paced and decidedly intense action game of the type Nintendo rarely produced, but which would have gone over well with American kids. The viewpoint and world structure, a top-down perspective with an overworld and castle dungeons divided up screen by screen, greatly resemble The Legend of Zelda at a glance. But in action, the two games don't actually play much alike. Zelda may have presented an action-oriented take on the role-playing genre, yet that adventure moved at a fairly methodical clip and required players to match their finger dexterity with an eye for discovery and a certain amount of discipline. It also gave players access to a massive inventory of tools and weapons to be deployed at optimal moments, adding texture and strategy to a persistent open-world quest. Murasame Jo shifts the balance far more in the direction of pure action. It moves quickly, challenging players with numerous on-screen foes at any given time and its approach to inventory management takes an arcade-style angle. You have no subscreen, and you can't juggle items. Only collect temporary boosts and ammunition that automatically augment your basic abilities. You play as a lone samurai, Takemaru, who must battle his way through five castles to free Edo-era Japan from the demonic threat of the sorcerer Murasame. Rather than taking place within a large, interconnected sandbox world a la Zelda, the game plays out across five self-contained stages. Each stage consists of two phases, the approach and the castle. The structure doesn't feel too far removed from the format Nintendo would use for Kid Icarus at the end of the year. The overworld area tends to be relatively linear, while castles sprawl across huge, complex mazes. 
Morasa Meijo's overworld definitely has more nuance than Kid Icarus's. Not only can you backtrack, you often face diverging paths that force you to choose a route. Though of course you can always backtrack to the screens you initially pass over to hunt for goods there. Even though you don't have a significant inventory to manage here, you can find plenty of items and upgrades while exploring. You'll honestly find it difficult to advance without them, since by default Takemaru is armed only with a katana and weak shuriken. Perhaps unexpectedly, your katana doesn't serve as your primary form of attack. Takemaru attacks contextually, linging shuriken by default and only wielding his blade to strike in-close enemies or deflect enemy projectiles out of the air. Like his buddy Link, Takemaru favors one side for his blade, so you need to learn to orient him correctly to be able to attack or defend up close. When no enemy or other hazard is within striking range, Takemaru instead flings infinite projectiles. In practice, you alternate between attack forms here quite often. Enemies attack relentlessly in droves, constantly swarming Takemaru, and relying increasingly on ranged attacks from all angles to keep him on his toes. In most screens, you'll need to manage up to half a dozen enemies at a time, and striking one down will cause another to take its place until you slashed and pierced your way through that screen's allocation of ninja and monsters. Unlike in Zelda, enemies don't respawn on a persistent timer across the screens. Once you scroll away from a screen, everything resets, and you'll instantly find yourself beset by those vanquished foes again the moment you return. Given the speed and relative linearity of the game, Nazo no Murasame Jo can ostensibly be completed in about half an hour. In practice, no one is likely to actually pull that off on their first attempt. This is a tough and demanding game. Not only do enemies attack in relentless droves, they appear in a constantly accelerating upward curve in terms of the threat level they represent. The basic ninja you battle in the first stage, Aosame Castle, can be managed pretty easily since they wander around aimlessly and toss their projectiles pretty slowly. But they soon begin to appear in greater numbers with more aggressive AI, and before long you have to face off against mid-boss type enemies who launch dangerous explosive projectiles that can't simply be deflected with your katana as they'll explode and inflict damage on Takemaru. Aosame Castle itself is patrolled by swordsmen who can only be defeated in close combat, samurai who box you in while tossing deadly projectile streamers, and durable Hanya masks masquerading as captive princesses, which will chase you doggedly across screens until you destroy them. Once you reach the second stage, Akasame Castle, you suddenly find yourself beset by ninja who observe the tradition of the divine wind and rush at you to explode on contact. Tengu demons who warp around the screen while flinging unpredictable whirlwinds and dangerous mines that explode on contact. The interior of the second castle ramps up the threat level accordingly. The swordsmen are accompanied by warriors who wield windmilling halberds, shoji screens bearing flaming skulls that launch projectiles at Takemaru from the sidelines, and an even deadlier boss than the first, capable of peppering the screen with exploding projectiles and turning invisible when you move into strike. By the end, you're battling a seemingly infinite host of Oni-style demons and a labyrinth built of skulls and blood as you move to destroy Murasame himself, a massive gargoyle sealed in the form of a statue yet nevertheless capable of bombarding you with explosive ranged attacks, and who blocks the path to the true final boss. While Nazo no Murasame Jo definitely stacks the odds against players and poor Takemaru, the game dishes out power-ups as quickly as it does hellish underworld forces. You'll frequently come across projectile upgrades that turn your tiny shuriken into large spinning blades or fireballs capable of piercing obstacles. Although these upgrades have a limited stock before they revert to standard shuriken, they can be further supplemented with ammunition scrolls dropped randomly by defeated enemies. You can also augment your projectiles by collecting special tiles that enhance their attributes, allowing you to fire them in a triple spread, in four directions simultaneously, or in an ultra-wide forward blast. Takemaru can also learn special techniques by finding hidden tanuki that grant him a limited selection of spells. You begin the game with the ability to activate an invisibility cloak three times, and finding those invisible tanuki will either recharge your spells or grant you a new one, such as the ability to unleash lightning that wipes out everything on screen besides bosses. To further balance the odds, Takemaru can also acquire new gear, including armor, sandals to help him move more quickly, or a helmet that grants temporary invincibility. All of these items can be found around the various levels, hidden away as a means to bolster the replay value of what is a fairly short game. Takemaru loses his upgrades when he dies, though he does respawn where he falls until he runs out of lives. And knowing where to find abilities to restore those powers is key to surviving the adventure. Not unlike a Gradius game, the going is brutal until you upgrade your strength a bit. Again, Nazo no Murasa Meijo doesn't really feel like your typical Nintendo fare, 
being far more of a white-knuckle, arcade-style affair than the games the company would become known for. Overall, it has more in common with Sunsoft's Iki or Capcom's Commando than it does with Zelda, though arguably it's better than either of those. Which again, raises the question of why it never made its way to the US back in the day. Certainly its classical Japanese setting and ninja and monster style shouldn't have been a detriment, given the fact that Nintendo was comfortable giving a license to Bandai's Ninja Kid and Data East's Kid Nikki, both of which deal with the same material. Although Nazo no Murasume Jo goes a little harder on the traditional Japanese imagery, it's all steeped in enough of a fantasy vibe and presented so vigorously that it requires zero cultural literacy to enjoy. The most esoteric imagery to be found here comes in the form of the shogi tiles that you collect to acquire certain weapon upgrades. Each one is imprinted with a different kanji, identical to actual shogi tiles, which denotes the power each tile contains. But those graphics could just as easily have been tweaked to something else in localization. All I can guess is that Nintendo of America felt the brazenly hellish imagery of the final stage was just a little too likely to set off the Jesus-free contingent of the PTA. Whatever the rationale, we missed out, which means we also missed out on all the references to the game Nintendo has made over the years. Heck, even an overt nod in WarioWare DIY was turned into a Pikmin homage for the US release of that game. It seems a shame. It's a hectic, challenging game with an entertaining theme that probably would have done fairly well for itself, considering the popularity of Commando and Akari Warriors in the early days of the NES. For the moment, you can still buy the 3DS Virtual Console release a fine way to catch up on one of the most accessible and interesting Nintendo Famicom classics that got away from Western fans. Next time on NES Works Guide In, we get back into the standard Famicom chronology with 1985 and a whole bunch of games that actually did make it to the US.